Welcome, friends, to the first section on cardiac physiology. As you probably noticed, cardiovascular physiology is a subject where, more than almost any other type of physiology, you tend to see the same concepts and terms pop up over and over again, rather than having to memorize a bunch of facts. But kind of like physics, you have to have a deep enough understanding of these concepts and be able to apply them to a huge range of physiologic and pathologic cases. Today, we're going to familiarize you with the vocabulary of cardiac physiology, the parameters that define the function of the heart and the relationship to one another. By the end of this episode, you should be able to 1. List the parameters that determine stroke volume. There's actually four of them, but first aid lists three because the last one's relatively low yield, so I'll be satisfied with three. For each parameter, you should be able to define each one, explain the effect of each on stroke volume in approximate terms, and identify at least one physiologic and one pharmacologic way to modify each parameter. Finally, list three main determinants of myocardial oxygen demand. If you look in first aid, you see a seemingly random collection of words along with their definitions and associated concepts. So the first thing we're going to do is put them all in context. Now, of all the variables listed on this page, can you guess which one is the most central, the most important to cardiovascular physiology? Ha! Trick question. The answer is cardiac output. Got you good, didn't I? The reason is because at the end of the day, the heart's a glorified pump. And the job of any pump is to get fluid where it's supposed to go at an acceptable rate. Your tissues need the heart to pump a certain volume of blood through them every minute in order to provide the oxygen and nutrients they need, as well as cart away carbon dioxide and waste. When that doesn't happen, you have what's called heart failure. When you look at the heart from a pump-centric standpoint, the volume of blood pumped out per minute depends primarily on two things. The volume of blood pumped out per heartbeat, and the number of heartbeats that occur in a given minute. Stroke volume in turn is determined by contractility, or how hard the heart squeezes, preload, or how much the heart fills during diastole, afterload, or how much work the heart has to do during systolic ejection, and another one that's not mentioned in first aid called compliance, or how easy it is to fill the heart. Increased contractility, preload, and compliance all tend to increase stroke volume, whereas increased afterload tends to decrease the stroke volume. And that makes sense, right? Because if the heart has to do more work, it's going to get more tired and pump out less blood. Now, how exactly these four variables define the stroke volume is a lot more complex than simply direct or inverse proportionality, though. And the relationship between them is beautifully represented by one of my favorite diagrams, the pressure volume loop. Definitely check out that video after this, because knowing how these interact is a lot higher yield than simply knowing the definitions. But baby steps. We're still getting through the basics. Myocardial oxygen demand is kind of the odd man out in this group. Unlike the others, it's not a parameter that helps define the cardiac output. Instead, it's included here to illustrate the cost of increased cardiac output. See, despite its central role in allowing normal metabolic activity in all the tissues in the body, the heart is one of the most metabolically demanding organs in the body. Many of the factors that increase cardiac output, including heart rate, contractility, and afterload, will increase that metabolic demand. That's one of the reasons why the heart can't simply ratchet up all those various parameters infinitely to keep infinitely increasing the cardiac output. When the heart's pressed to produce more output than its oxygen supply permits, particularly in the presence of something that simultaneously limits oxygen supply, it becomes susceptible to what's called demand ischemia, which can sharply limit the ability of the cardiac output to increase. For now, though, let's focus a bit more on the factors that determine stroke volume, since understanding what governs each of these is central to understanding of the heart and managing cardiovascular physiology. So contractility is one of the most intuitive parameters that increases stroke volume. You squeeze harder, and the amount of blood you pump out increases. Simple. And as with all muscle contractions, what intracellular ion permits the contraction to occur? Calcium, right? Now, there are a lot more sections that discuss the specific importance of calcium in a cardiac myocyte over a skeletal muscle, but I'll leave that to those other sections. Point is, the more calcium in the cell, the more actin myosin cross bridge formation, and the stronger the contraction. Now, the body's main endogenous mechanism for increasing contractility is through the sympathetic nervous system, specifically the beta-1 adrenergic receptor, which increases intracellular calcium through the protein kinase A pathway that you can read about more in the pharmacology section. The problem is, beta agonists tend to increase heart rate and contractility simultaneously. And why might that not necessarily be a good thing? Well, for starters, this tends to increase your myocardial oxygen demand in two different ways. But ramping up the heart rate with beta agonists also puts you at risk for developing some pretty bad tachyarrhythmias, including the frequently lethal ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. 
Another major pharmacologic agent used to increase contractility is digoxin, which works by inhibiting the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. You know, the one that pumps out three sodiums and brings in two so potassiums. While it's not immediately obvious how this relates to calcium, as it turns out, there's actually a sodium-calcium antiporter that uses extracellular sodium to drive calcium out of the cell. So if you have less extracellular sodium, like with digoxin, you can build up more intracellular calcium. Now the cool thing is, since the sodium-potassium pump is the one that resets all the ions after an action potential is fired, inhibiting the sodium-potassium pump increases the refractory period, which tends to slow down the heart rate, even as it increases contractility. Pretty cool, huh? Well, it turns out this is cooler in theory than in practice, since digoxin is actually not that safe a drug and has a horrible therapeutic index, but I'll let you check out the pharmacology section for more details. So, the drugs that increase contractility, also known as positive inotropes, have potentially serious consequences, especially the longer you use them. So when a person's in heart failure, it helps to know how to optimize their heart function besides just giving them drugs that might, you know, kill them. Fixing a patient's hypoxia, hypercarbia, and acidosis will permit optimal myocardial crossbridge formation without undue side effects. So if a patient's in bad heart failure, addressing these should be an initial part of your resuscitation. Finally, in patients for whom the blood supply to the heart is a known problem, like those with coronary artery disease, it's often beneficial to intentionally limit the contractility so they don't fall prey to chronic demand ischemia. Beta blockers and the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, verapamil and diltiazem, can be used to pharmacologically limit the heart rate and contractility. Increasing the preload, or how much the heart fills during diastole, increases the stroke volume in a manner that's actually more complex than you might realize. Check out the section on the Starling curve for a better explanation. But the important thing to remember is that since for the most part, the ventricles fill passively with venous blood, the main determinants of preload are the amount of blood in the circulation and the constriction of veins, which are the capacitance vessels that control the proportion of blood in active circulation. Preload also depends to some extent on compliance, since the ventricles fill more easily if the walls are nice and stretchy, instead of stiff and rigid. Of all of these, afterload is a concept that most students have trouble with, and is determined by three things. You can probably guess one of them. What's the most intuitive determinant of how much work the ventricle has to do to contract? Every time the left ventricle contracts during systole, it has to overcome the pressure in the systemic circulation to open the aortic valve and eject blood. So this ends up being the major determinant of afterload. But technically speaking, the pressure doesn't accurately describe the work the cardiac myocytes are doing. See, pressure vectors point in or out of the circle, and the actual cardiac myocytes are pulling circumferentially like a rubber band in order to generate that inward pressure. Now this is actually a more accurate measure of the work that the cardiac myocytes are doing, and it actually has a name in physics lingo, the wall stress. But deriving the wall stress from pressure requires the input of dimensions from the left ventricle itself. By the law of Laplace, the same one that gives us the meniscus in a tube, the radius of the ventricular lumen is directly proportional to the afterload, whereas the ventricular wall thickness is inversely proportional. Now, I realize that it may not be completely intuitive as to why this makes sense, but I personally find it most helpful to remember the relationship in terms of acute versus chronic heart failure. See, in acute decompensating heart failure, the contractility is severely limited, so the fastest way for the body to compensate for the reduced cardiac output is by increasing the preload, or how much the heart fills. Unfortunately, that's a dumb move, because it turns out that, surprise, surprise, one of the problems with systolic heart failure is that the heart can't respond to increased preload with continuously increasing stroke volume. At a certain point, the heart says, nope, I'm done, no mas. But the body keeps trying to push more blood into it, resulting in a widely dilated left ventricle that becomes counterproductive because the increased radius starts to cause increased afterload. For this reason, one of the most effective treatments of acute CHF exacerbation is to basically give the patient's body a slap in the face and say, hey, cut it out with the preload already. It's not helping anyone. Pharmacologically, this means giving nitroglycerin. It decreases the preload quickly by causing venodilation, and at higher doses can actually decrease the afterload as well by dilating arterioles and reducing the blood pressure via decreased systemic vascular resistance. But if the progression of heart failure is gradual, especially when it's secondary to chronic hypertension, then the body isn't faced with the same urgency that causes an acutely decompensated heart to be slammed with preload it can't handle. Instead, the myocardium gradually hypertrophies, and the greater wall thickness allows some of the wall stress to be taken off the cardiac myocytes. But this isn't a good long-term solution either, though, 
as the hypertrophied ventricle ends up limiting its own blood supply by virtue of its bulk and experiences reduced wall compliance that can limit preload and contribute to diastolic heart failure. Drugs like hydralazine that dilate arterioles can be used to limit the chronic elevations and afterload, but the drugs with the greatest evidence for benefit in chronic heart failure are probably the ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers. These decrease both the preload and the afterload, but probably the greatest reason for their efficacy is that they interrupt the process of ventricular remodeling in a way that's not completely understood. Ultimately though, neither the radius nor the width acts as a primary determinant of stroke volume in vivo for a number of reasons. One of which is that increased radius is generally associated with a mitigating increase in preload, and increased width is offset by decreased compliance. These ventricular dimensions are useful in understanding the pathophysiology of heart failure, but generally, when we discuss afterload from this point on, we'll be focused specifically on the contribution from ventricular pressure. It's not 100% accurate, but it's pretty close, and is consistent with how it's taught in most other places. Trust me, you'll have more important things to break your brain over. Alright gang, you put in some good work. Time to test what you know with a flash quiz. Your question is, how does dobutamine, a beta-1 agonist, affect the cardiac output and the myocardial oxygen demand? Now, this one may look like a softball, but make sure you explain how, not just whether it increases or decreases. And the answer is that dobutamine increases the cardiac output. Cardiac output, from a heart-centric point of view, is defined as the heart rate times the stroke volume, and beta-1 agonists increase both the heart rate and the stroke volume by way of increased contractility. Both increased heart rate and increased contractility, however, do contribute to increased myocardial oxygen demand. We got through some tough concepts, but at the end of the day, here's the bottom line. The cardiac output, in terms of volume output per minute, is the most important determinant of heart function. Cardiac output is equal to the heart rate times the stroke volume. Increasing the preload, contractility, and compliance tends to increase stroke volume. Afterload, which is primarily determined by ventricular pressure, tends to decrease the stroke volume. And finally, increasing the heart rate, contractility, and afterload all increase the myocardial oxygen demand. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Remember, there's a lot more to these relationships than we went over. Be sure to check out the sections on the Starling Curve and Pressure Volume Loop for a closer look at how preload, afterload, and contractility all relate to stroke volume. But that's it for now. If you like what you saw, go ahead and give a thumbs up down below. And as always, comments are more than welcome. Take care of yourself, friends. The fun's only just begun. Thank <laughs> you.